right, I'd like to welcome, welcome you to the second of our seminar series for this, uh, this semester. Uh, today we have the good fortune to have Fred Whitford uh, speak to us. Um, Fred is a clinical engagement professor in the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology and the director of the Purdue Pesti Pesticide Programs. He served as the director of the Purdue Pesticide Program since 1991, so he has a good sense of history. Um, he's authored more than 300 publications, which is intimidating, including eight books and 140 extension bulletins. He's delivered more than 6,000 presentations throughout Indiana and the United States in recognition of his achievements uh, to extension outreach efforts. He's received numerous awards including the Frederick L. I'm going to say this, Holde, Holde. Holde, Award of Excellence in the Education Service to Rural People of Indiana, the Outstanding Extension F Faculty Specialist Award from Purdue Extension, Excellence in Extension Award from the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and Honorary Master Farmer by, which I, that was a good one. That's a get. good one. Yeah. That's a good one. By Indiana Prairie Farmer and the Purdue University College of Agriculture. So it's really uh, a pleasure to welcome Fred to speak today. Well, you bet. And thank you much for the, the introduction. And so for the young people out there, if you work really, really hard, Bill, you accomplish these things, right? That's because I'm old, what you see the talks and publications, but you got to work at it. So this probably started about 25 years ago when I was at Purdue, and I asked people, uh, you know, who are we in extension? And so, you know, you, you, get, you get answers and they're not very uh, meaningful. And so I started doing a little bit of work and it's basically now, yeah, about 25 years worth of research on the history um, of the school. And that's what we're going to talk about. And this is actually pretty important. If you are a new faculty member, sir, why is this important? You might be a faculty member, or you might go to work in the, uh, I'm speaking to a gentleman here, it's one of your students, Bill. So you can, go, you can go to work for a university, you can go work for industry, you can go work for the ag retailer, you can work for lots of people. Why is it important to know a little bit about the history of where you're working? Uh, just to see how we contributed to the development of society and what we can do moving forward yeah. as well? Uh, yes, every, uh, so his comment is what can we do to move forward and so you, you need to know who, who you work with and what that culture is. It is important. And so we have, I bet I've taken a hundred classes that they've asked me the same stupid question every single time. How many of you have had the, 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 uh, the moral act? Did you have it on test? Uh, I mean, you shake, um, and then there's the Hatch Act, the research, and Smith Lever. And you're thinking, man, how many times do you have to test me on that? But we, we keep, keep testing on it, and I never understood. I mean, I got the questions right. It's kind of hard to miss. Um, so let's talk about Purdue. Before there was, um, you can see in 1862, it's the Morrill Act. It's the Civil War that's going on, folks. And during this time, they want to create colleges, universities that are aimed at working people and their children. We already had the Eastern schools. Uh, we already had all of these schools set up for basically for rich kids. Well, they wanted to just do a land grant, which is why your land grant schools are agriculture and engineer based, and no, whether it's Ohio State uh, or any, uh, any of the others. Now, the way they funded that was to sell federal lands. Indiana has no federal lands except for the down in the southern part of the state, which is the forest. And so what they did was they sold, you can see, 390,000 acres out of Nebraska. And from that sale to the public, they raised uh, uh, roughly uh, 212,000 or about $6 million in today's uh, uh, value. Now, you can see that it was originally called Indiana Agricultural College. Uh, but then you can see that they had to name it by 1869. They got plenty of years, and the way that government works, you wait till the last minute to answer questions. And so on March 3rd, 1869, the General Assembly is in session, and this man right here shows up on the, on the last days and says, I'll tell you what, boys, 
I'll give you $100,000 if you, if you put it in battleground. If you never know where battleground is, you put it in battleground and I'll give you $100,000. You name it Purdue uh, University. Oh, they just laughed at him and thought nothing of it. Uh, he said, that's fine. I'll just keep my money. Well, you can see now time is going. April the 8th, he shows up at a special session. And so a special session is it, it, to be able to answer a question that you couldn't do. And every university in the state, every town in the state wanted it because they had money behind it. IU already had a curriculum set up. There was nobody in it, but they thought they could get the money. Long and short, he comes in and says, I'll tell you what, boys, I'll give it now $150,000. I'll give you 100 acres of land, and that 100 acres of land is right here. And you have to name it Purdue. And what I really liked is you have to pass a law that says you can never change it. I thought that was pretty clever. And so, so you know, so we, we, got, we became Purdue University, 1874 of the first classes. This is what it looked like. Now, if we were, uh, let me get my own bearings. So this building, uh, there is 26, let's see if that shows up, 26th Street is right there between the fences. And if you were looking right out here, right across the street would be a uh, ladies hall, and then uh, you can see the building. I mean, it wasn't much more than a pasture. What we always considered the school of ag is on this side of 26, and until recently it was all ag. Now, this guy here, this shows you that one man can make a difference. His name is William Carroll Latta. And you notice he was here for a long time. In fact, he died while working, 1935. The reason was Carnegie, for some reason, I still don't know why, were involved in retirement plans. And they told the university what they wanted done, sir. In order for you to get retirement, you have to make your curriculum stronger. You have to have it a much harder way to get into Purdue. At that time, you just needed two years of high school to get at Purdue in the School of Ag. The people in Ag said, forget it. We ain't changing it. And the school says, fine, you don't get retirement. And so these guys would work until they dropped. And you see a lot of these guys like that, and it wouldn't be the, until the 1930s, though they got late 1930s. Now, Latta was very instrumental, um, and I'll tell you some little, little stories as we go. He dies in 1935. Can you see the name on his ship, the W.C. Latta? Back then, this is World War II. These are called Liberty ships, and these Liberty ships carried tanks, bombs, equipment, and they were manned by merchant marines. Uh, until recently, merchant marines have just recently been recognized as playing a very important part. So they were manned by civilians that handled the cargo and then the guns. But you can see that W.C. Latta named after him. The 4-H kids in the state raised $2 million to build these ships, to build a ship. It took $2 million about three to four months to build them. And what, what was not neat, because they had tanks, when they went off the coast uh, going to Europe, Europe the battleships and stuff would be here. They would put these ships way over to the left, way over to the right, because we had torpedo, sh uh, torpedo uh, submarines off of our coast, and when they bombed these things, it went up. The neatest thing was I had a chance to actually find a couple of the people on it. He's now dead, Rossetti. Uh, and so that's what a merchant marines, they manned the gun. And I'll, his story, one of his stories that I can repeat, was they never carried people except for one time. And so what happened was, he said, their ship uh, went in, down to the, off the coast of Italy, and what they did was they had to move troops in closer. So these men would climb on the ropes to get on the ship, and they would go closer to the shore where the smaller ships would take them on in. And he said, Fred, you know, we, I was a merchant marines, and those guys could look out there on the beaches, and they were just getting mowed down. These men on these ships knew that they were not going to make it, and yet they climbed those ropes and went on to the beaches. Uh, it puts war in perspective sometimes when you hear stories like, like that. 
Well, 1890, 1890, you can see the Purdue, uh, Purdue is growing. We're having some uh, buildings put up. Uh, this is the library today, Stewart Center. Have any of you noticed the rock? There's a rock right outside of Stewart Center on the front, and there is the first ag professor. These were where we did our corn research. That's where the corn research was done. In many universities, and I think Missouri's one, Arkansas is another one, they still have the original plots that they do work on. They, that's, that's a heritage plots or whatever they call them. But uh, so that there, he, he would become the president of uh, uh, Colorado State. But Latta was here. So when you came to Purdue, this is where you went to school. That's it. Uh, so this uh, Fendler Hall would be right here, and right behind it would be the what they call the Ag Experiment Station. We call the Ag Administration Building today. That is the building. It had been condemned forever, uh, but they kept using it. Um, for, for, and again, you can see here, I don't know how well it comes up, but you can see here the Experiment Station. All right, so you had the university that was set up to teach. You got an experiment station. And so the kids would, um, uh, some of the older pictures, there is Latta uh, staying right there. You can see Latta right here on this one. Um, and they're talk talking to the kids about various things of the day. For me, what was really neat, and Amy, we may need to have your help here to see. Go ahead and click on this. On the screen. There we go. Thank you. That's the voice of God. I just heard it. I know. Thank you. All right. So, what was really neat, if some of you remember uh, uh, taking notes, and what did you do with your notes when you were done with them, Damon? Yeah. Well, yeah. And then most of the time they're gone, though. I actually found the notes from 1901 of, the court of what Latta taught this almond mace, which was pretty clever. So this guy had, still had the, the notes. Now, what Latta did was two things. We had no students. The common thought is, why would I send kids to Purdue? I already know how to plow. Okay, there's a start to everything. Uh, we didn't appreciate the science because you've, if you, you basically, they said we farm gardens. We didn't farm like real farmers. They didn't trust the data. And we still have that today in part on our small plot work, though we've shown over the years that it works pretty well. So what Latta uh, did, he created a winter ag school. Have any of you ever met somebody who graduated from the winter ag school in your family? Bill, you have? Uh, you, you, and we go to these meetings. So they would come for eight or 10 weeks. And you you sit at the table with them and have dinner and you say, uh, are you Purdue graduate? Oh yeah, 1945, uh, short course. They were graduates of the university. Uh, now they would come here, they would live here during the winter because the rest of the year they had to work, and they would they would live here with these houses. Um, and because we had so many show up then Purdue says, we don't have the buildings, we don't have the space, we, we need buildings. And it was these short course people that actually created that. And so this is where we get Fendler Hall and whatever it is, 19, uh, 1912, that would become, well, where we're at today, that would become the standard. Which I laughed when they redid this building. We had, a, was anybody here when they rededicated the building, a couple of you? And they were, they were sitting up in chairs, and it was, oh, man, there he's probably about 90. I said, sir, why are you here? He said, I went to school in this building. I said, yes, sir, but why did you come back for the ceremony? He says, well, you know those steps that come up? They used to creak. And I said, oh, yes, sir. And he says, I came back just to see, did they take the, the creek out of the wood when they rebuild it? And I said, no, sir, it still creaks like the good old days. And he was happy. That was a, a true story. But Fendler Hall. The other thing that he did was, again, it's only him and a handful of other people. He created something called Farmers Institutes, thousands of these. There was a committee in the county, and what they would do is this committee would tell Latta, we want something on corn, we want something on potatoes, we want something on home ec. 
and Latta would get people that he knew were good farmers. There's no extension, there's no, it's just who he thought was good farmers. And uh, he would, these people would ride the trains and they would go to the locations and they would go, uh, and you can see here some of the things, and this was what, what is this one? This is 1899, you can see here what some of the topics, free mail delivery, I think that's probably, probably a good topic that we ought to be talking about now. Uh, but you can see what's good tillage, domestic economy. How do you feed a family? How do you do nutrition? Still important, uh, extremely important. Um, again, if you can, they had music and all that. Uh, how do you breed for cattle, how, forage and grains? Folks, nothing changes. It's the same thing we do today, except technology has changed. Uh, uh, ways that we approach things are different. The science has been, obviously, has changed. One of the ladies uh, that Latta hired was Virginia Meredith. Any of you know Meredith Hall? Guys, you don't know where Meredith Hall is? When I asked this out in the state, yeah, most guys would say, yeah, yeah. I said, well, how would you know it? Because the wife's there. I said, how would you know it? That's a ladies' dorm. Oh, you get some good arguments going. I think that's pretty cool. But she was one of the first farmers. She was a real farmer. She owned her own farm. She was a cattle breeder, knew how to make money. And one of the things that trans translates, transfers, no matter who you are, is can you help me make money? I don't care who you are, what you look like. If you can help me make money and you've got a proven record, I'll listen. So she would be the first... Uh, a woman at Purdue, she would ride the trains all over the state. They would pick her up and then take her to the meeting. Um, she's a pretty, pretty good rider. And so she, she did both. Mary Matthews, which, let me get my bearing, is Matthews Hall is right across here, right? Matthews Hall was her adopted daughter. She was big into home ec as well. And she did, she did two jobs. How do I raise a family? How do I raise cattle? But you can see here that uh, she understood the marketplace. Um, if a woman can make bread and direct someone else how to make bread, she can surely do something like make hay. So, and her idea was that these were complex areas that uh, people, sh that, it, that if I could do the home ec, I could do anything. So again, she was doing uh, both of them. Uh, so it, one of the greatest pictures I've seen was Amelia Earhart and her met. Amelia Earhart was a young woman at the time. Virginia Meredith was, a, was an older woman uh, when they were building Memorial Union. It was quite, quite a clash there of the, of the two individuals. Uh, she was so important, she had her own page in something called the Breeders' Gazette, which was a major powerful magazine. Uh, for those of you that don't know, these trade magazines are extremely important on how we communicate our thoughts, even today. Uh, 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 here, what Brian, it would be Indiana Prairie Farmer would be one. Any others come to mind? That's one that... Successful farming. Successful farming and all of those are extremely important in, in terms of us getting information out. Another little side note here um, in, in the talk. This is President Stone. So President Stone and his wife love at Stone Hall. They still call it Stone Hall. Um, and they love mountain climbing. Mountain climbing was something that was important to the elite. Uh, you, I, why, I don't know, but it was to the elite. And so uh, he gets permission to go on vacation in June, and he goes to the Canadian Rockies. So he and his wife are climbing up, Damon, and you, I can just, they're climbing up. He was the first one to ever climb this mount, whatever it is, Etna, whatever. And he's about three-fourths, maybe 80% of the way up. And he, the wife stays there. He's going to go climb to the top. So as he climbs to the top, his wife is sitting there waiting on him to come back. And she doesn't have long to wait. Because as she's looking, he's dropping. He, he fell off. And so she's hanging on because she thinks he, he, that she's still hooked up to him. And so when Winthrop Stone went down and didn't pull her down, uh, so she lived, he would die, uh, obviously take weeks to find his body there. Uh, and so our president was this guy right here, um, Marshall, who was on the, on the um, um, trustees. 
he was the editor of the Journal and Courier. And he was our president for quite a while before we got Elliot. But I thought that was not a cool story, but kind of a neat little sideline. This is the man named John Skinner. John Skinner showed up. You can see what kind of students we had at the time in 1907. We only had 100 students here at Purdue in the School of Ag. It was not, again, uh, we were not really accepted. Um, and again, you can kind of see how many were getting degrees. Um, Skinner, you give him credit for all of the buildings over here. Have you ever noticed how the buildings all look the same? That's because that's how they built them then. He was the one that got all of the money uh, by getting more students in and by using the winter short course. And he would be more of the person like our dean today, who was the dean of agriculture, uh, of research, teaching, and extension. Prior to him, or, or there was three chiefs, one of teaching, one of extension, one of research. Um, and folks, that was always a battle uh, back in those days. Uh, 1924, can you make out any of the buildings here? Oh. <laughs> All right, so Bill said he saw the lily greenhouses. That's a bad joke, but, uh, but yeah, there, uh, you can kind of see there, there is where we, Experiment Station, there is Fendler, there is the ladies' dorm, and if you kind of look over to your left, you see nothing. The kids uh, came to school. Fendler was where we had most of the programs. Uh, some things don't, uh, don't change. Uh, what Skinner did was pretty clever. He needed people to graduate. He had jobs for him. He just needed them to finish up and come here and not get discouraged. So what he did was he broke up, instead of, he broke it up to people's interests. Dairy was huge. So he wanted a dairy uh, option where people could specialize, kind of like what we, what we do today. And you can see he expanded, expanded that list. Back then, you, you took English, Chemistry, math, physics, in the first two years were loaded with those classes. Well, a lot of these farm kids coming off the farms, that, I didn't come here for that. I came here to learn about corn and beans and pigs and potatoes and whatever, tomatoes. So what he did was he recognized that he had to keep these kids in school, so he reorganized where the kids could get some of their ag courses up front to, to keep them interested. He fought with the other side, because back then it was the other side. And he fought because they, they were not teaching math, physics, chemistry, science in a way that the farm kids could relate. And he stayed, and so they created a lot of programs specifically aimed for kids to explain physics as an example, using farm examples. Oh, this is what I like. So ma'am, he, I, I, he, they've got some of the cards. Uh, first name? Rose. Rose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Rose. Come on in and see me, Rose. So, Rose, you'd show up to the Dean's, to the Dean's, Fendler Hall. You would show up. He said, Rose, have a seat. Obviously, I was almost there. I'm old enough. He'd say, Rose, have a seat. Rose, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing fine, uh, uh, Dean, Dean Skinner. Yeah, you are? How's your classes going? Oh, they're going fine. And then what he would do is pull out your card. Everybody had an index card. He says, Rose, your chemistry teacher says you're lazy. That you have bad grades because you're lazy. Or you drink too much. You ought to see these cards. <laughs> I, you ought to see these cards. And so everybody knew that when you went to see the dean, he already, he, there was a reason you were there. Uh, so, did I, are you saying we described her well or not? Okay, be careful there. So he knew, his idea was he tried to keep these kids in school because that was important then, A, uh, just like it is today, right? Isn't that a major, uh, not, not, what do you call them, uh, there's a name for it. You make sure that we get uh, as close as we can to whoever starts, finishes. Um, and, that, and that was important back then too. And the professors found jobs. So you filled out the pieces of paper, and you would tell them what you wanted, and they would try to find you jobs, which was not a hard thing because we had so few graduates. Now, what was neat is the kids could leave here and go to the Purdue farm. 
this right here is where Lily's at. So they would leave Fendler Hall and they could come right here to the Purdue Farm, which, uh, which is what? Two streets over is the Purdue Farm. And if you've ever looked uh, without my glasses, is that the, uh, yeah, isn't, that's the uh, uh, judging pavilion. It's still there now to give you perspective. Um, so right there is that road that runs between the pavilion and what, what would be Lily. So the kids could come there, they could uh, actually see everything. And if you notice here, you've got, uh, you've got the dairy, you have got the judging pavilion, you've got the, it's got hogs and cattle, and, uh, and I need to get the right name for that one. He is it Hedrick's Lab? What is that lab? Where is it at in here? Right there. It, what is, is it Hedrick? That's Hedrick Lab, which is still there. That was the horse barn. Um, and then the cattle barns, the, you had chickens out there, and you had the orchards. So the kids actually would practice uh, what they were learning uh, by going to the class. This is just shows you inside the judging pavilion where they would look. Uh, and we also brought the, uh, the, the winter short course and other groups here to, uh, to learn about the latest research. Because in ag, we learn about things by listening and seeing. That's, it's always been that way. Anything unusual here, does anybody see? Nothing went to waste. You got the pigs here feeding up on, on any of the waste that the, uh, that the cows are, are given. We started doing a lot of research, on-farm research. And this is Mr. Mace that I told you about his uh, book. Look at that corn. And if you just look at how things have changed. And so uh, because of the research, we got uh, the Ag Experiment Station. Uh, and you can see here, on-farm demonstrations, Purdue research, bulletins, press releases. The researchers, sir, tried to break it up and write abstracts that they could give to the papers who would print it. And it worked. I'm doing all this research and wasting money because it's not getting out. So what happened was uh, all of these men and women out in the state who never even heard about Purdue, who couldn't travel because we had no roads, there's no automobiles. And so this is where that extension uh, uh, act came in and be able to provide some of the, the ability of county people to do the talks. This is what it looks like. Uh, you know you're in Indiana when the pig makes the family portrait, right? Uh, if you looked at the clothing, these are the feed sacks. Uh, my wife, that's what she, when she was a girl, that's what they wore, where I'm from in Louisiana. So it's not like this goes way back, but uh, again, it was poverty. And so the idea was, how do we help people to make more money to, to help them in their lives? Uh, this is how they went to school. The only reason I show it is the bus, the opening to the bus is in the back, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Uh, rats. We had rats all over the place by the millions. And so we've had rat campaigns in extension. Uh, doesn't this guy look, he looks like he's accomplished something, right? The guy on your right, he looks like, uh, what's that Mutual of Omaha? Does anybody, you remember Mutual of Omaha? Anybody remember that? Has to be? Wild Kingdom. Wild Kingdom, that's it. That, the Mutual of Omaha was the sponsor. Wild Kingdom. And if you're young and you ought to look at those because you had an old guy that was there and he had always said, yeah, we were fighting this alligator in the water and the old man's in the boat, and the young guy that kind of looks like that is in there wrestling with the alligator. But uh, we would have huge campaigns to kill rats because every rat cost me $2. And $2 was a lot of money if you think about every rat. The kids had to work, and so the kids became a target of extension in terms of teaching the kids. Uh, and again, whether it's all kind of work, it was none of this stuff about kids can't work, that was just expected to be part of the farm life because that's how you learned. Now, let me find another young, young, young man right back here. First name? Uh, Matt. Matt, and when you talk, push that button down when I'm going to ask you a question. So Matt, and keep it pushed down, right, Amy? Yes. So everybody can hear it. So Matt, in extension, we're trying to move people some direction through research, right? Or experience or both. So Matt, you can watch, see this little girl here is watching her father do, uh, basically cleaning up that plow, right? Correct. 
Yep. Now, I'm going to show you a bunch of pictures. You can watch these kids watching their mamas and daddies, and you can see here what they're learning. This is how we learn today. I mean, nothing changes. Uh, and here you have generations. What's the problem from an extension or research perspective with that? I mean, that's how we all learn. But what, what does that pose to us problem-wise? With, with kids just watching? Yeah. Uh, they're not actually doing it? Oh, yeah, yeah, but they, but they, they will. Oh, that, back in, they did it. I mean, you, you did the work, but can you see that if, if the daddy uses old-time science of what his grandpa taught him and his father taught him, and he's passing that down. I mean, I hear that all the time, but that's not how we did it. Well, yeah, but this is 50 years later. Times have changed, right? So in extension, we're trying to break into that gap to bring new information um, to, to the scene uh, to try to add that, that value of what we do here through the research. Back in the days after World War I, we had a lot of extra dynamite. So the government said, what do we do with it? They said, give it to the extension agent. Them and farmers can use it. So we had live demonstrations on how to blow up ditches so they would flow better. Can you imagine today saying, uh, Dean, you want to come to our meeting? We're going to have a live demonstration on how to blow up ditches and stumps and rocks. But again, you can see here, and that's how we, you know, it was pretty cool. Hogs were important and still extremely important in this state. And when it came to hog, we, uh, the first agents had to deal with something called hog cholera that was killing thousands. Uh, Purdue had developed a vaccine, and we were able to, to use the vaccine. Again, extremely important today as it was since the beginning of time. Now, if you have, Damon, if you have hogs all on the ground, and there's a move for some people that want to buy this, let's just call it roam, free roaming, organic, whatever. What's the problem you could have if the same animals are always in that same spot? They're going to accumulate pathogens. Uh, you say pathogens? Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And in this case, it's worms. So we had to convince farmers to spend money on, on things to kill worms. And, and farmers today don't want to spend money. You really have to work hard, and, and Bill here, uh, if you, I don't know if they can see you, Bill, but in your weed science programs, in Brian's weed science program, you want them to add more chemistries into it to kill these weeds. You're looking at what, 50 bucks an acre? What is it? And they said, you got to be nuts. But there's a reason, and we talked about some of these nasty fields we've seen, and them not doing it. So pathogens. So what we did, we told people, bring your runt pigs to us. And so these farmers would bring these runt pigs, and this guy here would autopsy them right there in front of you, open up that animal, and then they would, what they were going to show you was what? Worms. Just, just this mass of worms. Because the worms were eating the food, the pig wasn't getting it. So that's how we sold vaccination. One of my favorite pictures, it's just too bad, it's kind of blurry, or they made the cover of a book. He's looking down at... Uh, at a bee smoker, if you've ever used one, they're pretty simple. Look at that boy's face. I know what he's thinking. God, if I could just get my hands on that thing, what could I do with the smoker is what he's thinking. But back then, honey was important, uh, a source of sugar, and also for selling. And they had some terrible diseases that uh, uh, back then that were costing about 40 to 50 percent of the hives. And so they went around helping to identify them, and then you burn the hives. Uh, fruit trees. Um, in this particular state, we never made anything off of fruit trees because of insects, diseases, um, and everything. But uh, during the Great Depression, what we were able to show through the science that if we sprayed the trees, not only could you get good fruit that you could use, but to sell. Now, this man couldn't afford a sprayer, so they had what they called spray rings. And they would all go together to buy a sprayer. They would all go together to buy the chemistry, and they would spray. And this guy here made $300 off of his crop that year, which again, back in those days, they, they generally didn't make anything. Now, do you notice anything about the trees? My daughter has trees like that. These are old trees. If you ever go to any of the modern orchards, you will see that these trees are much smaller. I don't have to climb like this. 
Um, again, th those are advances in all kinds of science and technology. I'm a, I love the old signs on barns, and some of these are just pretty cool uh, signs that this guy's trying to sell his products. Lime. Can somebody tell me what lime is important for? Bird, you know what lime's for? Uh, to be honest, I don't know what lime is. Okay, that's okay. So our soil here is too acidic. So every farmer is going to add lime to their fields every so often to raise that acidity because the plants can't grow in, certain plants can't grow into it. So extension, you can always tell the extension, that's the guy in the hat suit. All right, there he is. Now, it was easier said than done. The lime came in on rail. No roads. Can you imagine having to come with these carts and pick these up? If I could get two tons, which I uh, doubt it, but if I could get two tons per acre and I had 90 acres, that would require me to make 180 trips. All right, ain't going to happen. But if you were close by, then you would have all these men. That's how the, we unloaded it. If you were lucky, I guess, they would unload them at the, uh, off the tracks. I'm not sure how much better that is. I still got to get in there and, and lift it. And then this is how you applied the lime. Uh, he had them in pile. It's all labor, all physical labor. And then we need to teach him a little bit better, uh, Brian, about overlapping, I think, don't we? <laughs> that, that would help. But, uh, but overlapping just a little bit. But again, a, a, just a, a lot of labor. And so soybeans came in. And soybeans was actually not for what we do today. Soybeans could grow at these strange pHs that we have. And so the soybeans became our hay crop. Soybeans was a hay crop. And that's what now uh, these folks that have livestock, instead of growing alfalfa that they couldn't grow, can now have soybeans. One of my favorite shots again, except that it's a little bit unfocused, uh, whoever took it. Can you tell how they're shelling the beans? And I'll point you right up under here. Can you tell what that is? They've got the car jacked up. And they're run and you can see you can see it running off the tires. Now don't do this. I mean OSHA would not approve of it today. But back then, you know what? It, this is about two steps away from duct tape, right? Bailing wire. But this is pretty clever to make things work. Uh, the corn. When we did the corn, there was no hybrid corn. So we would teach these men as they went through the fields to select their ears for next year. We had quality on their ears. We asked them to take their ears and to have them spread out so they would dry and to put them into an area that would be protected from the cold. Now, in those days, uh, in the early 1910s, 20s, and 30s, a third of the crop was already dead before they even planted the seed. Because the seed had stayed outside, it was cold, and it killed the germ. So what Extension did was, we would tell farmers, bring in your ears of corn. And you've all done this in science, right? Where you take any kind of seed, you wrap it up in water. This is what we were doing. And then we would test every ear. Every ear was, well, again, had their row, and they each had numbers. And the extension person would, after germination, would look at, in, uh, would look at diseases and germ rates. And if it wasn't all of the seed, uh, and I can never remember how much seed is on an ear of corn. Does anybody know roughly? 16 by 50-ish. So how much, how much is that? Oh. About 800. So if, if I had one out of every five that was bad, you just do five out of eight. You can see how many kernels would be bad, right? This is why they wanted all of them to be germ and with no disease. So that's how we were able to improve yields. And then the best, most efficient way to harvest your crop was to run the pigs through them if you had it because meat was worth more than corn. And so you harvested and then they left you a little bit of manure behind. Um, then you could see the guy here. He's kind of up in this corner here, uh, harvesting. There is his backboard that he throws in. And then the equipment started coming in, and then the tractors. Again, new innovations uh, occurring. Electricity. 
There's many places that I travel in the state, people tell me they didn't get electricity until the 40s. 30s is real common, 40s. Um, and so electricity was extremely important because it allowed us to have motors and other kinds of gizmos. And from my perspective, it brought the radio in for everybody. And Extension really had programs on sheep, uh, series program on uh, pigs, chickens. We actually used it to, to, to be able to reach, uh, reach these people. One of the neatest things um, was the trains. Purdue would send trains out across the state. And these trains that you see here, somebody's doing a talk. I believe this was on corn bore. Uh, you would go to the trains. They would have displays. Uh, again, another corn board display for the, for the entomologist out there, where we would bring the science to them, show and tell, right, Damon? This is show and tell at its, at its best, which is what we, we try to do. Um, and you can see devices on how to, how to beat the corn bore, which we, we lost that war, and then what, the genetics took care of that corn bore, so now we don't even mess with it. Uh, but you also had displays where they'd bring in uh, the dairy cows, they would bring all kinds of stuff in here, and these crowds would just watch us. And this went on for like 40 years, because people couldn't come here, so we brought it to them. Uh, here you brought in your soil samples, uh, they would tell you how much lime you needed, um, and again, that was a free service to help. And then the ladies had their nutrition, and again, I'm not downplaying this, this was extremely important because it was the women that had to get this food to feed these people, their families, large families. They also had to tend to their illnesses and sicknesses because there was no physicians. And so this was extremely important, the nutrition. In fact, it's more important today than I think than it's ever been. Um, soybean displays, again, as soybeans was coming into the state, you know, what are some of the things that was important to these, to these people? Now, sir, you would want if you're trying to make money in the uh, ma'am, 1930s, you have no money. Everything counts. So if I had 100 chickens, if I had 100 chickens, how would I, what do I want from a chicken? Eggs or meat. Yeah, so eggs. Okay, so I want eggs. Well, if I had 100 birds, how do I know which one's not land, which one's just eating food and not give, it's, it's not, this is not a, a shared resource. You give me back or you're going to end up being what? Meat. All right, so how do I know that? I mean, I think there's a way to check in terms of anatomy. I raised chickens. So, so tell, okay, so you tell me. There's an anatomical way to look okay, and like feel around. Simple. Yeah. There's a visually, it was called the three-fingered rule. And if where the egg comes out, if that sucker was three fingers open, she laid eggs. This was research. It's not made up, it was research. Farmers say, hey, that ain't right. That chicken looks pretty good. So, they, so what we did was we took the chickens that were three-fingered chickens, and we put them in this pen, and we put the old ones in this pen, fed them the same, watered the same, and guess what we showed? That the three-fingered rule worked. So we called out thousands of chickens. I'm sure people got tired of eating chicken, uh, but that's where they ended up at. And in fact, it's poultry that saved many of the farms in Indiana during the Great Depression because it brought money uh, 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 in the state. This is what your typical dairy looked like. Uh, I mean, that's the sanitation level. I, again, I love the old signs, milk on the farm. Uh, here, we're teaching people that the milk is spoiling, so we're teaching them to put it into their well water. Well is about 55 degrees, and I can save the milk. The, I can't remember, I think it's about 25 dairy people would go together. Purdue would hire a milk tester, and Damon, he would test, or she would test, uh, how much butter fat that animal put out, how many gallons of milk she put out, and then lastly, uh, how much feed she ate and we could look at the numbers to see was she returning for what I was putting into it. If she didn't, we just sold her to another farmer. So, and we just moved, moved on. This is how milk was delivered. Uh, again, you think of today how people would just go nuts over this. Uh, actually, some people might enjoy this coming back. I shouldn't say that. 
Um, you know, there is a real fancy guy there delivering his milk. The ladies during World War II were the ones that providing labor. All the men are gone to war. The men that are on the farms, if they're not, they're working in the factories making planes, bombs, and everything else. It was the ladies. And what I did not know until, until the last month on a book I'm working on, we had German prisoners here by the thousands. We had Italian prisoners housed here in, across the country in Indiana. And these prisoners could volunteer. They got paid to go work. We also had conscientious objectors. They were also put into camps. And they were, if they couldn't fight, then they could help on the war front. But it was the ladies that were extremely important. Rationing was taking place. So this garden was not a hobby. This was how you fed your family because food was scarce during the war. Everything was going overseas. Another cool story. When the Japanese took over the islands, they took over a plant called kapok, I think a K-A-P-O-K. That was the fiber they put in life preservers. So when the men and women got shot down out of planes and ended up in the water, life vests, they could float or on ships. When they took it over, we had no fiber. And Bill, you're going to love this, you and, and Brian, because you guys are all the time trying to kill them. The milkweed plant, some Russian guy had did the research out of Chicago and found that the milkweed floss was just as good as the kapok. Now, young fellow, we have no labor. World War II. Everybody's working. There's nobody left but the kids. And I've met two of these people in just the last two weeks, which was kind of uh, cool, that these kids would actually go pick the milkweed pods. They would bag them in onion sacks, dry them. They would load them up at the railroad, and it went to Michigan at a plant that would make the fiber. And then that fiber was sent to the, to make, and they made over a million life vests. So it's no telling how many kids that saved. Um, and then during the World War II, there was, you, you couldn't buy a tractor, you couldn't buy a car, you couldn't buy tires. Uh, everything was being recycled for the war effort. I mean, it was unlike the wars that we have today where the population was involved in that war and they had to sacrifice something. Um, and here you can see them getting all the metal uh, and the metal and stuff. And then lastly, we worked with the kids. We still work with the kids. The, you call it 4-H. We had 4-H back then. And these kids are learning by hands-on. Uh, again, some of these are extremely old pictures. Uh, the, the girls could work hogs just like they could anything else. We competed, and we still compete for these things. And any, nobody's going to recognize who this guy is, I bet. I know what, if you're old enough, what it looks like. Anybody? I can't remember his name. Huh? I know. It's Alfalfa. Alfalfa. Yeah. Go, yeah. You have to be old enough, or, or you've seen a clip or you've heard it, but it's not. This is Gillum Stewart. This is Stewart Seeds, which still exists today, but it's been sold to... I don't, it's been sold to another company, but they've retained. So back in there, you, you taught people uh, how to do things, and a lot of these young men and women would do something with that later on in their careers. And so I, I guess the whole point of this talk is, sir, do you see we have a culture of trying to help people, right? And that's what we've done, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's research that's today or tomorrow, Damon, right? Because some of this research is applied today. Some of it we hope is applied in the future through new discoveries um, and or extension. How do we deliver that information? Uh, nothing's changed. That philosophy is still there. That's what we do for a living, at least in my opinion, in the School of Ag. And we train young people to be able to get these practices and trades and profession and techniques to go out and basically you know, keep pushing the science forward as we always have. So, um, on the sides, uh, if you're interested, we've written, these are the books we've written. I don't make a penny off the book. It all goes back to Purdue. So, buy them good. If you don't, I've already got them published. Uh, there's Mr. Latta. There is uh, Virginia Meredith. There is Skinner. Uh, this is the story of the extension educators on the right. 
um, up until the Great Depression, what we did. Um, there is pictures from their annual report uh, in a book we call Enriching. And again, that theme, Enriching the Hoosier Farm Family. Uh, this is a, another book from one of the people here that was a photographer. Oh, just wonderful photographs of, of that time period. And then the one that we're working on is this one right here that we're editing. This one is not available yet. I hope to have it to the printers sooner than later. It's just taking a long time to edit. So, but that's, that's the newest one on the Great Depression in World War II. So with that, I tried to make sure we had a little time if we have any questions. Uh, and do we have any questions from the online? Okay. Or anybody here have questions? Yes, sir, Brian. And push your little button and hold it down. I got it down, man. All right. So you are trainable. Where's your suit and tie? Uh, actually, great question. He's trying to be funny, but great question. So when I started in 1991, I only got one suit, and that sucker's 30 years old. So it's in style again. It just everything comes back around. <laughs> but it's in style again. So I went out there and did a talk, and I said, "This is stupid. I I don't." They were wearing bibs and overall. I mean, it's just back. I mean, it, it was people coming out of the fields and do our work with industry, all kind of industry people. So I said, this is nuts. So I started wearing this and I always have. And, a, and there was an old professor who said, Fred, you don't look professional. I said, I want to look like the people who I speak with. That's important to me. He says, you need to stand out. I said, I don't want to stand out. I want to look like them. So. The dress code, so to speak, is much different, Brian, then as it is now, because all of us tend to look like we do now, right? We try to look like the people we're, because if not, we're, we're, something's wrong with us if we dress up, at least in my opinion. Well, but, but the Aggie communists will, the Aggie communists always had a different opinion. I, there we go, the Aggie communists. You, you can help me. See, he's got a PhD, 30 yeah. years experience, but he can't push a stupid button. All right, very good. Go ahead. So, so what I've heard a lot of good ag economists tell me is they have to dress up because they want to look like they're talking about money, so they need to look like they have money. Well, what am I supposed to say? I, that wouldn't be me. That wouldn't be me. That would not be me. All right. Any other questions that we might have of things yeah, that you Yeah, I, I have a question. Uh, yes, sir. I mean, history is particularly useful if we can learn from it. So I'm wondering if you can think of something maybe we got wrong and something we got right. Ooh, that's deep. That's why he's a researcher. Something got, we got right was that we could use science to make changes. And we, we were very strong on that at the very beginning with Latta and all of those people. They just couldn't get it out. But once they got it out, we had the science and that it had to be repeated science because we were going to tell people, this is what you need to do. And as a rule, farmers don't want, and I say farmers, I work with lawn care people, the rest of them, they're all the same. Why do I want to change as a farmer when this is already risky enough? I know this will work. But if you do what I tell you, you'll make more money. So they hung in there on the science, and science is the underpinning of what we do. Now, I'm going to say science plus experience. And I think it's the experience part that we have not gotten right. I can tell you, Damon, about all of this stuff, research, and tell you all that, but if I've never made an effort to walk into your shoes, how do I know that that's in the context that you can use it? So what we got right was research is important. What we're getting wrong now is the lack of experience working with people. It's all too much computer stuff. And again, I use computers, not anti-computer. Is you got to get dirty. You got to go run a tractor. You got to harvest. I don't have to do. Uh, there, there was one I went out when I first got here with a lady uh, and her husband. And I said, all I want to do is plow. You don't come all the way here. Yeah, I just want to plow. So I got in a cab with that woman. She just thought it was the funniest thing. I came... But you know what? I plowed a lot of acres. Do I need to plow more acres? No, I just, I experienced it. So I think that's the good and the bad. One is science still underpins what we do, uh, but we're losing that experience part, I think. And these men and women from that time, it was experience. That added to the research. So I take research and I adapt it. 
that's a long-winded answer, but I think that those two things have to go together, and we're losing part of it now, in my opinion, again. Good question. Hard question. It beats somebody to ask you about why I don't dress up, right? That's a much better question that Brian had to ask me. Yes, sir. How do you address the challenges of increasingly um, difficult to grasp science, so like genomes and analytical chemistry versus the, the three-finger rule on a chicken? Uh, we've done this in the classes before. You think you're so smart. You ain't that smart. And you don't have to dumb down things to explain it to people. The people you work with ain't stupid. They're running million dollar operations. So you just have to figure out how to use regular language. And one of my most favorite ones, and it probably wouldn't work today, but back then it did. I remember Tom Bauman talking about genes and gene guns. He said, yeah, well, they, they load up the gene in this gun and they shoot it at the leaf and they know just enough to get it into the leaf so it gets incorporated. What do you think? I mean, that's 30 years ago, right? 25 years ago. Is that the concept? Yeah. Now, there's a lot of stuff there. So what you, what you, back up, what we try to do is to impress people. Just talk, just, you should be able to explain this. You learned it, didn't you? You should be able to take any of this hard science, most hard science, and able to explain it in regular words to people as if uh, your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, somebody who interest, because you are correct. Our level of science, understanding of science, is near the toilet. There's nothing there. I mean, most people are pretty shallow when it comes to science. Not that they're stupid, it's just they've never been exposed. And so what happens is they, they're easy to follow newsletters and other things that you're thinking, God, how can you believe that? Well, somebody, in fact, I'll tell you who did it. Who was the best person to communicate? Have you ever read Rachel Carson? There is an example how you take a lot of science, and again, people disagree with some of it, but how she could communicate it by making it simple. It was called Silent Spring. If you've never read it, it's just a, it's a great read. It's got some problems, but nevertheless, you can explain it. And so when we work with a lots, lots of uh, uh, graduate students, it, it, so you start to do your talk, I say, I don't understand you. I don't understand you. I don't understand you, because you're used to teaching and being in front of scientists. What I do is you say it over. How do you put that in English? Well, what do you, what do you work on? Herbicide resistance. Okay, so what's resistance? Uh, penicillin, we got resistance. What happened when you have penicillin resistance? It doesn't work anymore. That's correct. So what happens when you have herbicide resistance? It doesn't work anymore. And why do you get resistance? Selection. No, don't tell me that. Why do you get resistance? You use the same thing over and over again. And, and the plant does what? It adapts. It, it, English. <laughs> what does the plant do? It doesn't kill it anymore. You can simplify all of this stuff. It ain't hard. Now, Damon, there, there are some parts of it that is hard. I mean, and so it's not all, but uh, uh, from, from the, some of the laboratory stuff and what things do with genetics and all that, that I don't even, I mean, I don't even come close to understanding. But in, in terms of, but a lot of this stuff you have to be able to explain by just stepping back and saying, how do I talk like that? And then the second part is to be prepared. When that man or woman asks you a tougher question, that you're prepared now to go into the why behind it. So you don't have to impress anybody. Bill, you hear that? Amen. Yeah, Bill's the king of slides, technical slides. We've argued that. <laughs> he loves his data slides. Uh, uh, I didn't mean to rant, but does that make sense? What you do is you, you, you're not that bright. We're not that bright. If we were, we wouldn't be here. So we're, we're just educated people who should have the smarts to explain something, if you want to. Because you go in front of a group, if you don't, then you wasted an hour worth of talk and wasted their time if they don't understand you. We see a lot of that out in the, when you, 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 you work the circuit, you see that. So it's, there's nothing wrong. You don't look, in fact, you look smarter by communicating than impressing people with your science. 
Obviously, that's a pet peeve of mine, right? You can tell. <laughs> All right. Great question. Good question. So, Fred, we do have a couple of questions from our online or audience. First one, as a student of Indiana history, what lesson has been forgotten that you would like to remind us of? Mm. So, um, so they could, hear, could they hear you on that question, everybody? Okay, so the question is what, uh, it's almost what Damon, it's a flip on something that Damon said. So what, what is it we've forgotten? We have forgotten what this university is about. We have forgotten why this school was set up. And maybe things have to change, but I think part of it is we're here to serve the people uh, and all kinds of people. And that's, that's, our, that's always our job. And if you don't come from this culture, then you don't know that. And unless you go out, you don't hear it. But so to me, it's, it's, trying to maintain that connection to people. Okay. Awesome. Uh, one more. With issues of water contamination and soil loss, might going back to methods of rotation ag, as in the past, be a good idea for today? Um, um, repeat the question again, a little bit louder if you would, so they could hear it. So with s issues of water contamination and soil loss, might going back to methods of rotation agriculture, as in the past, would that be a good idea for today? So that question probably has a hundred different answers. They were studying water pollution back then. They were studying runoff back then. They were studying soil loss. So that's nothing new. So rotation is important and it depends on what that rotation is. If you're saying that our farmers should ro rotate back into livestock, the answer is we're probably way too off of that. We're, we're, we've left that train. It's already gone. Our distribution center is not set up to it. But we do have lots of rotation. So, uh, 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 Bill, you know, whether it's corn and beans for uh, obvious reasons or wheat, uh, some of them require less tillage. Some have less insects and weed damage, I guess. Uh, so, yes, rotation is important. And I guess uh, any of you here, I would say that rotation is one of the keys of agriculture today. It's not like we're going to go and do that. We're, we're already doing it. Would anybody disagree with that or that you, I think it's, it's already established. That's a done deal. And then now we add cover crops to that and other, other things though. Excellent, thank you. Any other questions from our online or audience? Any, any last parting shots? Um, again, if you're interested in the books, there's pieces of paper on these other tables. Help yourself. Uh, like I said, I don't make anything off of it. So, so I do this. Amy, thanks for y'all showing up. Uh, to the folks online, I appreciate you taking your, you know, an hour with me here to, to listen. Damon, thanks for having me here um, as part of the program. Much appreciated. So with that, then I'll just say thank you very much. Any closing, closing things, Amy or Damon, for do we know what next week's is? Next week? Doctors. So next week we have Dr. Yun Zhao um, giving a talk and it will also be here in Findlay and also online. So you can feel free to join us for that. Fred, I did have one final question come in if you have one minute. Yes. Why did beans become more important than alfalfa? Oh, uh, okay, I went through that. So beans, are, beans originally can grow in these lower acidic soils that we had. And since farmers couldn't get lime to go onto their fields, then that gave them a choice to have it as a hay crop. And then that meant that I could feed my dairy animals. I could, um, I could feed my animals, which is just like we do today. I mean, it's still an important animal feed. So because livestock was so important then, that was a huge advancement once the soybean varieties. And so for the person who asked the question, we would actually test the soybeans variety for hay quality, for bean, for, for uh, oil. We, we, we had different varieties that would do different things for us. So dairies could pick the hay, the hay one uh, for their needs and the other people could pick the oil. Like for World War II, we had beans for oil. So uh, yeah, it's a good question. I went through it too quickly. All right, with uh, that, let's uh, thank Fred. That was a terrific, interesting talk. Thank you much. Really, really interesting. <laughs>